This program features Carnegie Council Senior Fellow Wendell Wallach interviewing Shannon Valor. It was recorded on December 16th, 2021. It gives me great pleasure to welcome my longtime colleague, Shannon Valor, to this AI and Equality podcast. Shannon and I have both expressed concerns that ethics and ethical philosophy is inadequate for addressing the issues posed by AI and other emerging technologies. So I've been looking forward to our having a conversation about why that is the case and ideas for re-envisioning ethics and empowering it for the information age. But before we get to that conversation, let me introduce Shannon to our listeners, provide a very cursory overview of how ethical theories are understood within academic circles, and provide Shannon with the opportunity to introduce you to the research and insights for which she's best known. Now again, before turning to Shannon, let me make sure that listeners have at least a cursory understanding of the field of ethics. Ethical theories are often said to all fall into two big tents. In one of those tents, the determination of what is right, good, or just derives from following the rules or doing your duty. Often these rules are captured in high level principles, but the rules can be the Ten Commandments or the Four Principles of Biomedical Ethics. In India, they might be Yama and Niyama. Each culture has its own set of rules. And even Asimov's Three Laws for Robots do count as rules meant to direct the behavior of, of robots. So all these theories are said to be deontological, a term going back to the Greeks referring to duties. And it's basically saying that rules and duties define ethics. But of course, there are outstanding questions about whose rules, what to do when rules conflict, and how, how you deal with situations where people prioritize the rules very differently. In the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, Jeremy Bentham, a British philosopher, came up with a totally different approach to ethics, which is sometimes called utilitarianism or consequentialism. And basically, Bentham argued that you don't determine what is right, good, and just by following the rules. You do so by determining or considering the consequences of various courses of action and following that course that leads to the greatest good for the greatest number. Bentham's utilitarianism or consequentialism was later developed more fully by John Stuart Mill, but it also has limitations. For example, what do you do if the greatest good for the greatest number might entail serious harms to a minority. Now, though these two tents have been what most ethical theories fall within, there has always been a third tent in determining what is right, good, and just. And that is often referred to as virtue ethics. In the West, it's often identified with Aristotle and his Nicomachean ethics, but in the East, it's identified with the thought and work of Buddha and Confucius. And it basically argues that the core thing in ethics is the development of character through practice and habit. And what is right, good, and just is determined by what a virtuous person, a moral exemplar would do. Now, within virtue ethics, there are also debates over what are the core virtues or who deserves to be considered an exemplar. But virtue ethics for most, or at least the latter half of the 20th century was largely captured by those of a conservative political persuasion. And yet in recent years, it has been taken up by many philosophers of technology, a small cadre at least, of which Shannon is often seen as the leader. Shannon is a philosopher of technology, and she's the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Edinburgh's Futures Institute, where she directs the new Center for Technomoral Futures. She's perhaps best known for her book, Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting. 
and to which I will be returning in a minute. Before coming to the University of Edinburgh, she had been a professor at Santa Clara University in Santa Clara, California since 2003. During her fascinating career, she served as president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology and was the winner in 2015 of the World Technology Award in Ethics. But Shannon is not an armchair philosopher. As Google was being challenged over its ethics, it approached her to serve as a consulting AI ethicist for its cloud AI initiative. Shannon is also the editor for the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Philosophy and Technology. So let me first turn to uh, Shannon and the book for which she's most known, Technology and the Virtues, A Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting, and ask her to give you at least a brief overview of what that book is about. Shannon. Thanks, Wendell. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Um, yeah, when I wrote the book, I was uh, in a, a, a place where much of the literature uh, that I was reading about the ethics of emerging technologies from social robots to artificial intelligence to uh, biotechnologies designed to modify uh, the human genome. All of the literature around the ethical implications from these emerging technologies was pretty much drawing only upon uh, these deontological frameworks uh, uh, or rule-based approaches or alternatively applying these uh, utilitarian frameworks that, that you've described. Uh, and it, it seemed to me quite obvious uh, that this ignored, as you say, uh, a whole swath of ethical territory uh, that uh, actually is older uh, than uh, the utilitarian approach uh, and certainly uh, uh, not uh, uh, any less influential in the history of ethical thought uh, than rule-based approaches. And that is that third tent that you mentioned, the virtue ethical approach, which uh, in the West, as you say, we uh, tend to uh, regard as growing out of the work of Aristotle and later thinkers. Um, but there are, as I, as I described in my book, uh, also virtue ethical traditions that can be found uh, elsewhere in the world uh, from classical Confucianism uh, which is, is broadly conceived as operating on a virtue-driven or character-driven model uh, that emphasizes uh, not the rules that one follows, but the kind of person that one becomes and the specific habits and practices that make you into that sort of person. Uh, what's common across virtue traditions, whether we look at the aspects of Buddhism uh, that are uh, uh, well-described uh, as uh, appealing to, uh, to virtues, or whether we look at the Confucian tradition or the Aristotelian tradition or more recent attempts uh, to provide a more contemporary versions of uh, accounts of virtue. All of these share uh, a common idea, which is that we aren't born virtuous, um, that we become virtuous if we do only through our own efforts of moral self-cultivation. And that involves a number of practices and habits uh, that are part of our, our daily existence. Uh, Aristotle said essentially that we are what we repeatedly do. Uh, so we often hear people in society say something like, um, that wasn't my intent or that's not who I am after being called out for a pattern of harmful behavior. Uh, and, and what's powerful about the virtue ethical lens is it says, uh, if this is what you repeatedly do, this is who you are. Uh, and, and your self-conception or your excuses uh, mean very little. What, what matters is the kind of person you've allowed yourself to become through uh, the repetition of certain kinds of actions. Um, and what's powerful to me in what drove me to write this book is the recognition of two things. The first is how much technology reshapes the kind of people that we are precisely 
by reshaping the kinds of habits and practices that we engage in on a daily basis. The first inklings of thought that turned into this book emerged during uh, the introduction of the first uh, smartphones and the introduction of technologies uh, for social media uh, uh, platforms like Facebook. And my students were having their relationships and the way they talked to one each other and met with each other and communicated with one, each other, with one another radically transformed by these technologies. And I was seeing my own habits and practices transformed by them. Uh, if I compare the way I went about my day, um, pre-Twitter and post-Twitter, uh, uh, it's there are some stark differences and they have shaped my character for better and for worse. And I was recognizing that we weren't talking about this. We weren't talking about how technology actually shapes the ethical landscape. It's not simply that our ethics has to be applied to technology. We also have to think about how technology reshapes our ethics. But the second thing that I had to uh, uh, take account of in this book uh, is the way that our technologies have global reach uh, and, uh, and scale and impact. And that relying on ethical frameworks developed only in uh, the Western European uh, or Anglophone philosophical traditions uh, was obviously not going to be apt uh, or responsive uh, to a diverse range of global uh, considerations and, and needs uh, that, that people and communities have uh, from and in light of our new technologies. So I thought, what, what do we do about that? What do we do about the fact that we have technologies acting upon us at global scale, that if they need to be governed or, or steered in particular directions, that's going to require collective decision-making uh, at a global scale. And yet none of our ethical frameworks are global um, and they really can't be. There is no one ethical framework uh, that can be meaningful, I think, to all humans in all places and times. Uh, but what I found in this book, and this is where I'll sort of wrap up my, my, my kind of introduction to, to the book. Uh, what I found in the book was that although there are no universal or global ethical theories, um, there is this sort of under layer of common ethical practices of moral self-cultivation that get pointed to by different cultures, uh, developing accounts of virtue that are very different uh, but that build upon the same practices of moral self-cultivation, practices like um, relational understanding, uh, reflective self-examination, moral attention, um, prudential judgment. And I started looking at how these practices can help us develop a truly 21st century ethic for dealing with emerging technologies by building on these common human practices of making ourselves into the people that we want to be and need to be for one another. Um, and then I talked in the book about how that might be applied to different technologies from military robotics to robots caring for us in our homes to uh, technologies meant to change human nature uh, to social media platforms. So uh, I've been uh, then since then thinking about what else needs to be done uh, to make an, an ethical framework that is truly robust and inclusive and responsive to the new and uh, uncertain reality that technologies are, uh, are shaping. Yes, as I understand it, uh, you're working on a follow-up book that, that you at least call uh, presently The AI Mirror, Rebuilding Humanity in an Age of Machine Thinking. How about sharing yeah. you of the insights from that with our audience? Yeah, happy to talk about that. So um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about AI is that uh, it distracts us actually from paying attention to what's happening to our own thinking processes. Uh, and so when I when I talk in that title about machine thinking, it's it's sort of ambiguous. It's meant to point to this story we're being told that we now have machines that can think like we do. Now that story is false and every serious AI researcher knows that it's false, that the AI systems that we have today uh, don't think like humans do. Uh, they're not intelligent in the ways that humans are. Uh, 
Um, they're simply very clever uh, tools that use powerful mathematical techniques uh, and large mountains of data uh, to perform tasks that previously required human intelligence. Uh, so what we have are not intelligent machines, uh, but substitutes uh, that are practically useful in many contexts for uh, uh, human intelligence. But so when I refer to machine thinking, I'm not actually talking about AI. I'm talking about ourselves at that, uh, at that point in the title, uh, because what we have seen, and this predates AI, and it's something that has been commented on by uh, uh, philosophers, sociologists, and computer scientists themselves for decades, going back to the post-war period, uh, we, are, we are seeing an emergence uh, and a strengthening of a regime of uh, mechanization of human thought and applying uh, bureaucratic and technical uh, pressures upon human beings in order to reshape their thought patterns in ways that can be better accommodated by machines. So uh, instead of using the machines to liberate and enlarge our own uh, lives, we are increasingly being asked uh, to, uh, to twist, to transform, uh, to uh, constrain ourselves in order to strengthen uh, the uh, uh, reach and power of the machines that we increasingly use to deliver our public services, to uh, make uh, the uh, large scale uh, decisions uh, that are needed in the financial realm or in healthcare or in uh, transportation. And so we're, we're building a society where the control surfaces are increasingly uh, automated systems. And then we're asking humans uh, to restrict their thinking patterns and to reshape their thinking patterns in ways that are uh, uh, amenable uh, to, this, to this system. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was to really reclaim some of the literature that described that process in the 20th century from folks like Jacques Ellul, for example, or Herbert Marcuse, uh, and then really talk about how this is happening to us today in the era of artificial intelligence and what we can do about it. Um, and it's a, not a book that intends to blame AI for this. Uh, this is a phenomenon, as I've said, that long predates uh, the commercial uh, development of artificial intelligence. Uh, but, I, but I think that AI is amplifying uh, this process and speeding it up. And I think that we need to rethink what AI can be and what it can do for us, um, because I think those possibilities of using technology uh, to liberate and enlarge our lives is still available to us if we want to reclaim it. And that's what that part of the title is about, about reclaiming our humanity in light of all these forces that are being put upon us both by the technologies but also around these narratives that are suggesting that the technology that we are not only flawed but the technologies are going to be superior to us and that we need to be conforming our behavior to the technologies rather than asking that the technologies become more a reflection of of who we are and and what we need and um, how best again we can put the cultivation of character back at the center of human life. It seems to me that a lot of that has been lost through um, the weakening of, of religious traditions that so much of character development was identified with and notions many being perpetuated within academia that somehow all of ethical understanding or all of ethical judgment can be either reduced to characteristics that we, in, we inherited from our evolutionary ancestry or reasoning processes that can be performed better by machines than they can by, by people. So I, I just find this very exciting that you're doing so much to, to focus attention on the character development. And of course, as you know, that's also been so important to me throughout my life. I mean, I've, uh, I've meditated for 50 years and, uh, and think that self-understanding and the kind of natural character development that may emerge out of that is 
a lot more important than your ability to hone a rational argument, which is often just a rationalization for, for what you're doing. You know, it's funny that you uh, mentioned uh, religion uh, and, um, and its place in, in moral guidance and development, because uh, this too was actually predicted by uh, the philosophers of technology of the of the mid 20th century who saw this uh, uh, creeping uh, intrusion of something like the we could call it the technological sublime right the the kind of terrifying but also uh, uh, attractive uh, force and 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 mystery of of techno social power and techno scientific power that as this grew in the 20th century it it came to intrude upon um, the, the place of religion in a number of ways. So Jacques Ellul talks about uh, the sacred uh, and how uh, the, the, techno the rule of technological efficiency uh, itself becomes uh, the focal point uh, of our perceptions of the sacred. Uh, and it becomes the thing that we will sacrifice uh, uh, all else uh, to, uh, to protect and honor and preserve. And it's funny when you look at uh, online culture today, right? And, and you, you, you look at who people speak of in reverent tones, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's, it's not religious leaders primarily. Um, and it's not your average uh, sort of, you know, political uh, leader who are, most of them are, are treated with cynicism and scorn. Uh, it's, it's often these figures in tech Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they go through cycles of being revered and being uh, uh, disdained, right? But but there's this searching for uh, the the divine and the, the 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 kind of you know prophets of 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 the new world are are being sought in places like Silicon Valley, which is a very perverse place uh, actually to look for the divine uh, in in a lot of ways, and yet. You know, there's there's this gap that's been created, I think, between between power and goodness, um, mm. which have always been in tension, right? But the I think the divorce between power and and goodness is as stark today as it's ever been, and that's partly because technology is is the domain increasingly where power is concentrated, but we have long treated technology as if it's neutral as if it's not a domain where values apply. Uh, and what philosophers of technology, of course, spend much of our time doing is explaining why that's false, why technology has always been human, why it has always been embedded with ethical and political values. Um, but as long as we don't see that, we won't be able to reunite this, uh, uh, this breach between uh, the power that we have to, to change the world and transform it and the power that we have uh, to uh, to do what is right, to take care of one another uh, and our world. What's fascinating me about this is the extent to which we can turn to past traditions and perhaps reformulate them and revitalize them for the present and the extent to which that might be inadequate. And I get very caught up in the question of, well, how much is it just getting people thinking about virtues and character development and again, and all these qualities that um, are going to be very hard, if not impossible to view in our technologies. And therefore there is a really important role for humans in both the present and the future development of these technologies or whether we need to be reformulating how we think of ethics more generally and perhaps bring in totally new elements that have not been given adequate expression so far. So how do you see that, particularly given that you've uh, played such a prominent role in, in re-enlivening the attention that virtue ethics deserve? Yeah, I think, I think my interest is in understanding ethics as a, as a form of uh, creative response to the world and, and the challenges that it presents. So I don't think ethics is something fixed. One of the things I wrote uh, about in, in, in my first book was uh, the fact that the ethics uh, of, of past eras 
uh, won't won't serve us today, even though I'm diving into those old texts in the book uh, to reclaim these more fundamental practices. Uh, but the world that they describe as a good world and the world um, uh, that they uh, have developed notions of virtue in order to uh, to protect and, and preserve is not a world that we can have in the 21st century, right? We are, we are not able to support 8 billion people uh, by going back to living uh, uh, like the uh, ancient uh, uh, Greeks or uh, 6th century uh, 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 Confucians, right? This is, this is not going to be uh, the way that we uh, provide for human flourishing and planetary flourishing in the 21st century. So we need to free ourselves to be able to think about new ethical visions, but we also have to think about um, where our current ethical vision is failing us uh, and, and uh, confront that honestly. And I think it's failing us um, in, in, a, in a, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on three areas. One is it's failing us because most of our ethical theories, particularly in the West, uh, but even in traditions like Confucianism, have primarily uh, treated ethics as a matter of individual character and individual decision making. Um, so we have an ethics for individual moral agents that is about individual responsibility, an individual rationality, and individual virtue. And that doesn't cut it in a world where our problems are not uh, personal problems uh, so much as sort of uh, existential uh, problems uh, that affect the entire planet that cut across national and cultural boundaries uh, and that required radically different kinds of communities to come together uh, and uh, shape uh, intelligent policy. You've worked, for example, uh, in the area of uh, governance of uh, uh, the kinds of technologies that are being applied uh, in military contexts uh, as have I. Uh, and we both know uh, how challenging it is uh, to form a kind of coherent ethical vision of the future of military technologies uh, when you're dealing uh, with people who have very different views of, uh, of ethics, of human rights, and so forth. So we have to be able to recognize that an ethics that doesn't talk about collective uh, decision-making or collective action or collective deliberation um, is not going to serve us well. So that's one. We have to think about what an ethics that uh, works uh, at that higher uh, social level uh, and that allows uh, divergent uh, minds uh, and bodies uh, to cooperate and uh, develop policies that help them flourish together. Uh, that's an ethics that we don't have and that we desperately need. The second thing that we need um, is an ethics actually that dispenses with some of the uh, biases that have been inherited by worldviews that have primarily been developed by uh, a small subset of the population. Mm -hmm. Elite uh, 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 men uh, almost exclusively um, who were in positions of privilege and power and use those uh, to craft their theories of how people and society should be. And one of the things, one of the costs of that, for example, uh, is seeing something I've been really looking into deeply lately, which is the way that uh, values like care and service to one another are devalorized in ethical traditions like Aristotle, where he explicitly uh, says that people uh, who uh, are skilled in crafts and arts uh, should not be allowed to be citizens uh, precisely because uh, the crafts and arts are used to provide necessary services to others. And this is debasing or, de or demeaning for, for Aristotle, right? This to is truly a fascinating insight that you've derived from Aristotle. I, you're the only person I've ever heard even point to that. Well, it's, it's really striking because uh, it, it made me realize how much our ethics doesn't talk about things like uh, care and service uh, and, and didn't until feminist ethical traditions in, uh, for example, the 1970s uh, and 80s began to develop an independent approach uh, to ethics known as care ethics, right? That reclaimed these values. But what would the world look like if those had been the dominant ethical values all along, right? What would our planet look like 
if care ethic, if an ethics of care, uh, rather than uh, an ethics of, you know, sort of rational, con rationally consistent agency or utility maximization or happiness maximization, right? W what would an ethics of care have done for our world? We don't, we don't know, but I think we need to look to these kinds of alternative values, uh, the values of restoration, right? There's, there's some interesting work being done uh, on the notions of maintenance and restoration as core ethical values. So we focus on creation and building and innovating while we let our bridges and our roads crumble uh, and our, our, the things we've already built, we don't take care of. Uh, and we simply replace them often uh, with uh, um, uh, alternatives which won't last as long. Uh, we have laws that prevent people from repairing their own devices. And there's a lot of interesting ethical movements to change that. So I think that's something that we, we need to look at. Well, a lot of this seems to be a reflection of the enlightenment ethical tradition that has dominated the development of modernity now seems to be collapsing under its own success. I think people lose sight of the fact that that was a response or a compensation to the fact that the religious ecclesiastical and Aristotelian scholasticism, which dominated the world that came out of, was collective in ways where it stifled individual expression and it made the world very much about um, striving for an afterlife as opposed to transforming the quality of, of the world that we were in. And of course, what's so fascinating is how that's been perverted as an aggrandizement of individualism and of individual freedoms in the way where there is almost no need to be concerned about the impact of your individual freedom on the community at large or on humanity at large. You know, that's, that's gonna be difficult for us to get away from and difficult particularly if we don't expect something more than success from those who are leading the tech revolution. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I also worry about the, the sort of backlash to that excess um, becoming, you know, a, a sort of potentially destructive reactionary movement in itself. So mm -hmm. the anti-enlightenment backlash, right, has its own dangers. And so we need to be able to step back and say, what is it about the enlightenment that we have good reasons to preserve and, and reclaim and honor in a better way? And, and what are those aspects of the enlightenment that uh, honestly, we should have the courage to, uh, to, to go beyond and set aside. Um, and I think, you know, we, we have right now a culture where it reinforces notions of opposition and extremity. So, you know, people are either doubling down on the enlightenment vision and pursuing it in increasingly uh, reckless and destructive ways, or they're trying to get as far away as they can from that vision without always being guided uh, by something that's in itself just and sustainable. So, uh, you know, that's where I think coming back to these, uh, these other values um, might, might help us. Values like care, values like love. What would it mean to have you know, a, a world of technologies where care and, and love and service and restoration were, were the, the things that, uh, that designers had in mind, as opposed to efficiency or optimization or speed or scale, which are the values uh, that drive uh, technosocial innovation primarily today. So the values that drive technosocial innovation, they aren't going away. And sure. so now we're trying to introduce values that are often identified with, I think you're correct, that feminism is really what brought those values to the fore, um, largely in the 1960s and 70s, but they were obviously getting expressed well before then. Uh, there is this problem of how you integrate those values into the mechanisms of not only capitalist productivity and efficiency, but also governance and international relations and whether 
whether they can prevail or whether there's a kind of real politic about why things are the way they are that has wedded us to a form of inevitable machinery that's going to lead to an arms conflict, an AI militarization, or to the onset of smarter than human machines and the inevitability of that and the necessity for us to, to defer to them in decision-making because ostensibly they're supposed to be more intelligent than us. So I see that there's kind of three different wings going on here. One is it's this revivification of some older traditions that aren't giving their due. There's this expression and building and empowerment of values that have always been around, but don't really, haven't really been integrated into our social fabric effectively. So that becomes uh, care and humility and um, uh, alt, um, compassion, that, that, that whole, interhuman framework or interpersonal framework or social framework that, that's so essential for us to cooperate with each other. But there also seems to be a tremendous pressure to defuse a techno-narrative that is driving Silicon Valley, is driving their belief in what the future is and should, should be, and therefore we should all just get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And I see that, the, in fact, that's perhaps one of the areas in which you and I came together. Um, some of the first activity that Shannon and I did together was around a series of workshops uh, that I and Stuart Russell co-chaired, which were among the first workshops that actually brought the, the leaders in the development of AI together with philosophers and ethicists and engineering ethics and people who are looking at machine ethics, that's um, designing robotics or AI that was sensitive to ethical considerations and factored that into its choices and actions. And it was, it was a kind of fascinating session in that I thought that it was destabilized in the narrative, but then only went on to witness how the narrative went on in spite of, of some very direct challenges, some of which you made so clearly to some of the leaders of AI. And I'm not quite sure how we're gonna get around that. They seem to have an unbelievable megaphone at the moment and a capacity to argue that since we really don't understand and only they understand the technologies they're developing, we're gonna to have to defer in the short run to them in terms of how these technologies get managed. Yeah, I, I think we have a couple of things uh, going on here. So, so one is the, the kind of um, naive religion that has taken hold in um, certain corners of, of the tech world. Um, and it is a religion where you um, believe things uh, about, for example, our destiny to colonize Mars in you know, the near future that are clearly in conflict with uh, the basic laws of physical reality and our resources. Um, so you have this kind of quasi-religious um, futurology that, yeah. Uh, a, a certain subset of society uh, finds very attractive, okay? Uh, and that certain subset of society also ha happens to be the small subset of society uh, that uh, has uh, today largely a stranglehold on the power uh, to shape the trajectory of innovation and to decide, for example, uh, what uh, new kinds of companies and products will be invested in, right? It's all, it's within that domain of you know, Silicon Valley venture capital and startups uh, that th this kind of uh, 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 naive vision of the future seems to have a, a, a very uh, strong grip. There's another factor here though, which is that there are a lot of folks in Silicon Valley who aren't in uh, thrall uh, to these kinds of naive visions who actually have a pretty a clear-eyed view of the world and the circumstances they're in and, and what uh, is needed for a, a, a truly politically and economically sustainable future. Um, but there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley who have that clear-eyed view, uh, 
but are nevertheless operating in a system uh, that has uh, uh, been allowed to develop perverse incentives mm -hmm. that continue to drive these harmful sort of patterns because they in the short term reward people. And I have seen um, uh, how difficult it is for people who want to take the long term view, who want to uh, develop technology uh, in a way that actually will foster um, you know, human flourishing uh, in the next century, not just in the next 10 years. I've seen how hard it is for them uh, to, to get investment, to get buy-in, um, and, and to operate against all of the incentives that are currently running the other way, economic incentives, political incentives, media incentives. So I think we, we really have to treat this as not a single phenomenon, but as a, as, as a phenomenon that um, has partly a, a kind of cultural aspect to it and, and it requires a kind of cultural uh, enlargement of, pos of, of pos different possibilities for thinking about the future than this very kind of sterile and naive view that um, I, I think drives, you know, the, the people who think that Bitcoin, for example, is somehow going to uh, solve all of our problems uh, or that um, going to uh, Mars is somehow the way that we save ourselves from a, a planet that uh, uh, we continue to ruin uh, on, a, uh, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. There's, there's that kind of naivete, but there's also this uh, kind of political uh, solution right. that needs to be found where, where we figure out how the incentives that are currently broken can be changed uh, to reward uh, political action that actually uh, benefits uh, people over the long term. And I've seen a lot of people in Silicon Valley who are terrified about the future. They're terrified for their children. Um, they're, you know, you hear all these stories, right, about, about folks in Silicon Valley uh, buying up bolt holes uh, in New Zealand to hide in uh, because they're, they're convinced that the world is, is heading off of a cliff. But often they're the ones- Either that or go to Mars. Right. Um, and, and yet these are the people who have the greatest power to shape our present uh, trajectory. Uh, and, and so the question is clearly, even they don't believe mm -hmm. that, that the trajectory that they are steering us on is the one that takes us uh, to a, a future of human flourishing, then why are they staying on that trajectory, right? So let's talk a little bit about this issue of power and ethics, because on the one hand, I think what we're saying is these perverse incentives have been creating a juggernaut that is making at least those who love those incentives and the narrative behind that richer and richer, even in the midst of a pandemic when, mm -hmm. uh, when half of the world is suffering and billions of people are perhaps losing everything or what little they they had. And this question of whether ethics can be empowered in a way in which it helps nudge the trajectory into a more positive, a, a more positive um, outcome, or whether ethics itself is just too weak. And I, I and you know, of course, that this debate is going on within the AI ethics circle, uh, particularly among among those of us who have championed AI ethics for, for years now and suddenly are bewildered by what on one hand seems to be our success and on the other hand appears to be uh, a whitewashing of ethics by corporation, uh, a co-optation to return to Herbert Marcuse, who you mentioned earlier, where there's this capture by the corporations of not only the uh, the our educational system and our and the incentives within that but a reinforcement of those values that reinforce the trajectory as it is and so it raises this question about whether the success of the ai ethics movement itself is success at all Mm -hmm. or whether it is not dealing with the power dimensions in a way in which we can effectively diffuse some of those forces that are taking us to futures that may not be worth most of us living. Yeah, that's right. And, and we've seen this critique um, 
come from folks like uh, Kate Crawford, right, who has uh, said that what we don't need is, is ethics, what we need is uh, to talk about power. But that presupposes, in, in a way, what that does is that gives away the, the, um, uh, the meaning of ethics. Uh, it grants it to those who have uh, cynically stripped it of any ability uh, to serve as a critique of the unjust exercise of power, right? Um, if you say that ethics has nothing to do with power, you're, you're giving away the game, you're giving the notion of ethics uh, over to those who have depoliticized it. When ethics going back to uh, Plato, right, is, a, is fundamentally a question of justice and very much about power, right? Uh, so even in the Western philosophical tradition, ethics and power uh, and the discourse about uh, what power is good and legitimate, that those concepts are never separated in the classical tradition. Um, and so we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't indulge or permit uh, that separation. Um, and I think uh, at the same time, it's true that the kinds of ethics uh, that, that we are dealing with today do not have the right language or conceptual frames to deal with the challenges of power today. Um, and the mechanisms uh, that we have uh, for legitimizing power, um, as, as we've said, are, are largely captured um, by corporate interests uh, in ways that disable the kind of checks and balances in the political system that were designed uh, to constrain the unjust use of power. So on the one hand, I think the critique is right. The, the notions of ethics that we're dealing with need to be reinvested um, with um, a, a, a political vision of uh, what it means to use power legitimately. On the other hand, what I don't wanna see is a world where we imagine that by shutting uh, ethics out and talking about power, that we get anywhere at all other than the equivalent of might makes right, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you can't talk about ethics, if ethics is of no use to you, then there is no distinction between uh, legitimate power and illegitimate power. There is no distinction between justice and injustice without ethics. There is no distinction um, between power that should be resisted and power that should be uh, uh, sought and welcomed. Uh, there, is no, uh, there, is no, there is no good politics without ethics. Um, there's just whoever the strongest voices in the room who has the most guns or whatever it is that can do the, the, the most damage. And again, then we go back to Plato, right? I mean, the whole debate between uh, uh, in, in the Republic begins with this conversation uh, between Socrates and Thrasymachus about whether power is just uh, uh, what um, the leaders uh, say is, is good uh, or whether it has this deeper, uh, more robust meaning. So I, I think we do need to reclaim the notion of power, but I think we need to do that within the mode of ethical thinking. Of course, the, uh, the leaders of the, the tech industry will consistently argue that the only function of ethics is to restrain innovation and to restrain in development. And of course, we need development for defense against now the Chinese, uh, if not the Russians again, or who, whoever is there, but we need, it, uh, we need innovation for productivity. We need innovation to solve climate change, to, to cure cancer and so forth. And I think all of that's true, but it seems somehow we have to bring a twist into the conversation of ethics. So it just doesn't seem to be a bunch of constraints. And for me, that's one of the concerns I have around what have become the AI principles. As much as I applaud what are the prevailing principles uh, of AI, I think principles are not enough. We need to actually make the conversation about something very different. Now, in my, in my thought, the difference is this question of how we make decisions at all or who is the decision maker? Who does the decision maker need to be? 
to make effective decisions in this context of uncertainty that has been created by the, by the convergence of climate change and the destabilizing impacts of emerging technologies. And I think if we could move the discussion of ethics away from principles and values as the lead item to the challenge of making effective decisions that don't unravel in our face or don't precipitate more problems than they solve, that would be helpful. Now, some of the people who have been listening to recent podcasts that I've been on here for the Carnegie Council know that I talk about ethical decisions a lot as not being about binary choices, but really being about uh, navigating uncertainty through consideration of the real trade-offs that are entailed in the various courses of action we take. And that the languages of, of ethics are less about constraining decisions and more about bringing to light various factors that you would like, various elements that you would like to have factored into good choices and actions. But furthermore, once we make a choice, and we often have to make a choice, and every choice has its trade-offs, we should also be addressing the harms, the risks that might have been addressed more directly if we had made a different choice. We need to be engaged simultaneously in pushing forward our program or those goals or those ends that we seek, but we have to simultaneously be ameliorating the harms that are entailed in those goals. Otherwise, we actually in the end get nowhere. We create as much, much problem in our wake as as any supposed solution might be creating. Yeah, I, I think I agree with most of that. I mean, I, I absolutely agree, uh, certainly as a virtue ethicist, that a, a, a significant function of ethics is to allow um, good decision-making under conditions of uncertainty uh, and novelty. And that's what practical wisdom is, what Aristotle called phrenesis, right? Um, it's the ability to act in a to act well in a circumstance where you don't have a map or a rule book that was written for this situation. But I think we can't only talk about navigating uncertainty or making certain trade-offs uh, because we absolutely still have to think about uh, what are the ultimate values um, that our trade-offs will favor uh, and for whom. Uh, and as you say, who gets to choose what those trade-offs will be. Um, because you could have a you could have a very vicious person who's actually very good at making uh, decisions under uncertainty, um, and very good at analyzing trade offs. It's just that all the decisions that they make uh, end up being self serving uh, or uh, uh, harmful to others. And so you know this question that, of that means it's just not doing the second part of the equation I put forward, which is that that in making your choice a good ethical choice also has to include the amelioration of the trade-offs or harms that are left in its wake. But here's what I think is missing from that, right? If we right. only talk about ameliorating harms, then what we're doing is taking for granted our existing conception of the good and the, the world that we would like to exist. And all we're trying to do is sort of maintain the status quo by uh, suppressing uh, harms that might come out and threaten it. Uh, what we're not doing in that circumstance is saying, um, not just what are the harms, uh, but what is the moral vision that we have and how could that moral vision uh, be improved or enlarged? Um, and I think we, we are really missing that piece in the ethics conversation right now. I mean, that's in part, I think what is missing from uh, the AI kind of principles that you mentioned, which which are lar largely focused on harm mitigation. And I think we need to, I mean, we, there are many scholars who've said this better than I have. For example, uh, Rua Benjamin's work uh, in her book, uh, Race After Technology is uh, obviously uh, uh, um, more um, uh, uh, worth uh, your time than kind of listening to me talk about this. But uh, this notion of, the kinds of futures that the current power structure has allowed to be entertained 
um, and the way those futures and those goods have been constrained uh, by uh, the, the, the current uh, techno-social culture um, is, is really as important as uh, identifying and mitigating the harms that threaten our present understanding of, uh, of the world. So I'm gonna change the subject a little bit, though it's clear that we have just scratched the surface of a topic that could be developed in a, in a, in a much fuller way. But uh, I wanna to touch on two other topics before we, we close here. Sure. The one is um, the public square and whether present media platforms are offering us an adequate public square or could be restructured to give us an adequate public square, and mean by the public square, a place where we can all come together and debate out the futures mm -hmm. we want, the values that we want, we want to promote. And I know you've been you've written about this in the past and, and talked about this. Perhaps you can share a few of your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, this is something that I've spent uh, quite a bit of time thinking about. Um, one of the things I've thought about is, um, and, and I mentioned uh, the need to talk about ethics in light of the need for collective uh, deliberation and decision making. And I think one of the primary functions of the public sphere is to enable that, right? If you go back to Habermas or Rawls or anyone else you know, in political theory who talks about the public sphere, um, it's linked with this notion of, of uh, a deliberative democracy, um, of, of, of uh, a sharing of power in an important uh, way that, that uh, provides the moral foundation uh, for a good politics. And I think one of the things that I notice when I see the way that new technologies are shaping the public sphere um, is how uh, little they do in many cases to cultivate and sustain the deliberative virtues um, the ability to come together with others and listen uh, and uh, uh, deliberate. And deliberation is not debate, right? So what do you have on Twitter right now? Uh, you have a very vital uh, public uh, political debate going on every second of every hour of every day stretching across the globe. And a naive person looks at that and says, hey, the public sphere is more vibrant uh, than it's ever been and healthier than it's ever been. Look, it's accessible to anybody with a smartphone. That was never true, right? Um, it's, it's, it's available to people who weren't allowed to uh, uh, leave their homes uh, previously. Uh, and, and now they can participate from anywhere uh, uh, in the political conversation. So it's very easy to look at that and say, all right, the, the, what's the problem? The, the public sphere is, uh, 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 has, has expanded uh, and uh, and the modes of expression that we can add to it have only multiplied. And this is all true. And, and those are all in, in many ways, good things. Uh, but what hasn't happened uh, is any um, process of cultivating uh, the virtues of public deliberation and discourse that serve the public good. Uh, we, we go online, we throw out our opinions, um, we attack other people's opinions, and then we move on. And of course, there are little pockets where you can actually see deliberative uh, work uh, going on, uh, but they're not supported by the affordances of the platform design. Um, and, uh, and, and so they don't take hold and grow and, and sustain themselves. Uh, so you have people mistaking politics for, um, uh, for uh, political debate and performance. Um, and a, a true deliberative politics is really missing uh, in the public sphere right now. So I'm very interested in thinking about how we build back the conditions uh, that promote a deliberative uh, uh, exercise of, uh, of power uh, and uh, collective decision-making. And it seems to me, it's not just deliberative, it's relearning that we need to find ways of working together, of cooperating, yes. of working through these issues that we all share and are gonna affect not only our lives, but the lives of our children. That's that, exactly uh, right. That not opinions are not gonna solve the challenge of climate change. 
that we need many voices at the table and not just to be inclusive because there are many different perspectives which impinge upon the kinds of decisions or at least appropriate and effective decisions we can make that that uh, as i've often said intelligence doesn't belong to either an it doesn't belong to either an individual or a machine mm -hmm. it's collective it's embodied right. in culture none of us can know everything and we are now dealing with challenges that really require many cooperative voices many kinds of expertise at the table together and yes maybe even some of those voices in the present or future will be AIs, but at least in the present, they're gonna speak largely through the experts who know how to read their output and what their output put does and doesn't mean. Well, I would just wanna pick up on, on what you've said about um, the importance of understanding that it isn't just about inclusion uh, or even participation. If we still understand that as the model of individual preferences uh, being entered uh, into a ledger and aggregated, right? Uh, and unfortunately, that is the notion of uh, of democracy that, that many of us have, this notion that it's about sort of aggregating individual preferences, as opposed to coming together and confronting shared challenges, shared opportunities, and as you say, cooperating and working together to do things that none of us could do simply by having our own individual preferences indulged. Right, um, we can have a better world through this kind of uh, social uh, cooperation and solidarity than any of us could have if our own individual privileges uh, uh, and preferences uh, were to uh, be indulged at every turn. Um, you you look, in fact, at uh, some of the interesting pop culture uh, that's that's you know driving the conversation today. And I think about something like a show called Succession, right? Which isn't about technology at all, uh, but it's about a, a sort of broken family that uh, can't escape the idea that what they're supposed to do in life is pursue their own advantage at all times. Uh, uh, and, and the way that that leaves them uh, ever more broken, unhappy, bored, lost, desperate. Uh, there, there's, no, uh, there's no one in that show that isn't miserable most of the time, and yet they have uh, wealth and power that most people uh, will never uh, even approach. And I think it's a it's a it's a great testament to the sterility uh, and sadness of a life in which uh, we cannot see uh, the reality of uh, the common good uh, or shared interests as compelling. And so that's part of the cultural transformation that that we need. Uh, in order to get to the place you're describing. Well, this is one of the real attractions, I think, of virtue ethics and the building of character. Increasingly, people in a succession is a good example, I recognize them that they're caught in value systems, mechanisms, power structures, which actually don't really give them any choice. And that are functioning as juggernauts and they're taking them toward futures that are not viable, that are, yep. that are not sustainable. And ethics and the development of, of, of personal character and so forth are actually one of the few outlets or escape valves we have if you see that and you see That's that right. you are now imprisoned by, by mechanisms, some technological, some economic, some caught up in the language of, of security and defense that um, are just not viable. They aren't viable given the destabilizing challenges we have that are creating insecurity today. What you've, what you've just said is so important because even in virtue ethics, which focuses on individual character, the, the notion of individual character that someone like Aristotle was working with uh, was something that was uh, uh, derived from an understanding of shared flourishing. So for, for Aristotle, the highest good is eudaimonia uh, or, or a good life, uh, living well. But the way that he understood it was uh, the living well with others in community. And he worked backward from that to envision the kinds of personal traits uh, 
that people would need to have in order for that to be possible for them. But the ultimate good was never about simply individual virtue. The ultimate good is what that enables, which is this shared life together that is good. And that's what we have to come back to. And that's what we need to use technology to help us enable. There is one shared project that you and I worked on together. And that was a paper where we placed a challenge in front of the AI researchers who were expressing great concern that perhaps they were creating future AI systems that posed an existential risk to humanity. And their hope was that they could come up with some means of ensuring that those systems would have values that would be sensitive to human concerns. In the early days, that was referred to as value alignment. When the value alignment terms got challenged, they, they changed them and they will change them again. But you and I were persistent in arguing with them that the models they were using for, for, for ensuring the safety of these future systems were really bare fit. They, were, they, they really um, were inadequate, both from an ethical viewpoint, but also whether they could actually be expected to work. Let alone, they were all based on presumptions that these machines would have characters and abilities that we have no idea whether those could be implemented in artificial intelligence either. So we produced a, a paper together that was a critique of, uh, of this value alignment approach. And we basically said, you are not going to get trustworthy super intelligence unless you can have super intelligence that really inculcates the virtues, that you really have virtuous entities. And it's not clear that we know how to create virtuous entities in humans, let alone do we even understand all the characteristics in machines. Um, I wonder whether anything about that argument on our part, you know, has changed for you and whether you ultimately think that argument really is an argument to the technologists who are creating AI and artificial general intelligence and perhaps artificial super intelligence, or is it more about having a discussion about what really trustworthiness means in an agent, whether human or machine? Yeah, I, I mean, I think much of what we said in that article um, for me still holds true. And, and I, think, uh, I think it is perhaps something that's less likely to uh, be relevant for the development of future AI systems precisely because the current lines of AI research are heading in directions that are so far from where they would need to be oriented if we were actually trying to build virtuous machines, right? We're going in the opposite direction. We're not, we're not building machines that, for example, um, have more powerful abilities uh, to uh, gain a semantic representation of the world and, and how things are related to one another and, and, and why they matter or, or why, for example, um, uh, uh, things that, are morally significant for us uh, should be uh, attended to. Um, we're, we're, we're not building machines to gain those kinds of capacities that are critical to the development of virtue, capacities of moral perception uh, and uh, um, uh, the uh, ability to, to pay attention uh, to things that are, are morally salient, um, the ability to have a relational understanding um, both of, of the uh, relationships between humans and the relationships between humans and things. We're just, not, we're just not moving in that direction in AI development. So I don't know if our critique is really that meaningful for, for contemporary AI research. But I think, as you say, I think it does remind us of uh, what we really mean when we talk about uh, someone who's trustworthy. When we talk about someone uh, who's trustworthy, what we mean is we have placed something that matters in their care. And we believe that they recognize the value of that thing that has been put in their care and they intend and are capable of caring for it 
on our behalf. That's what trust is. It's when I put something that matters in your hands and I know that you understand why it matters and what that requires you to do, to care for it in the way that I would uh, want. And we, we know that that's not anywhere near the kind of capability that we're building in AI systems. So what we need to do is build human uh, contexts that can embed machines in ways that allow humans to care for one another's uh, uh, lives, bodies, minds, knowledge, and to care for the world in the ways um, that uh, trustworthy uh, uh, members of the human family would. And we need to have the machines that are simply aiding our ability uh, to be trustworthy uh, and uh, to uh, treat one another uh, and one another's uh, concerns um, with the kind of moral uh, attention um, uh, that they deserve. So thank you ever so much, Shannon. I'm going to bring this conversation to a close, but hopefully the dialogue, the, the reflection that we have tried to stimulate through this talk together will have at least brought some of you into this discussion about how we should be rethinking ethics if we want to make it viable and robust for the information age. So again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Wendell.